Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Sammy Saab, a uh, hepatologist out of UCLA. And today I'm giving you our medical ground rounds <clears throat> on a panorenal syndrome, a kidney injury, current diagnosis and treatment. Um, we have three objectives to cover today. We're going to review the clinical significance of acute kidney injury, uh, patient with cirrhosis, <clears throat> and talk about um, the updates and definitions. <clears throat> We're going to then understand the approach of kidney injury in patients with chronic liver disease, and then recognize the limitations of current therapies for pattern syndrome, and identify opportunities for new treatment. So first of all, cirrhosis is a major public health concern. Um, there are a number of estimates for the number of people with cirrhosis, and it's believed that there are over 600,000 individuals in this country with cirrhosis. Problem is uh, that patients with cirrhosis do not wear a badge. Most individuals have no idea they have advanced liver disease. In fact, uh, most physicians don't know their patients have advanced liver disease. And, and people don't pick up on, on very sort of clues, uh, like a large spleen on imaging done for another reason, the, the abdomen, or a low platelet count. But uh, out of the United States, uh, estimated that uh, less than 0.3% of the population have cirrhosis. If you look across the globe, across the world, the prevalence varies, but it's much higher. Uh, between 4.5 uh, and uh, 9%. Cirrhosis could result from an, a number of um, insults, uh, alcohol and liver disease, hepatitis B and C, uh, delta with hepatitis B, uh, fatty liver, and autoimmune disease. Um, also, certain medications, toxin infections could also lead to, to cirrhosis. It was not included here, our biliary tract problems like PVC and PSC and, um, and other things like metabolic problems like uh, iron overload. We've seen a, a huge a change in the indications for transplantation, a huge change in the cause of cirrhosis. Uh, for decades, hepatitis C was the most common reason for, for transplantation, the most common cause of cirrhosis. Um, with the advent of advanced, uh, with the uh, direct active agents, um, the demographics of cirrhosis has changed. And today, um, alcohol is the number one reason for cirrhosis, the number one indication for the transplantation. Um, at, at Rogers, you've done a wonderful job with advancing the research in liver disease. This is from a recent publication by Han and, and, and Nick. Uh, looking at novel therapies, see what we could do to kind of mitigate the progression of advanced liver disease, mitigate uh, the cirrhosis and its complications. We'll, we'll have to talk about very shortly. So people once they have cirrhosis, they could develop a number of complications. When they're overt, when they're obvious, we call them um, uh, decomposite liver disease. Uh, and this can include things like sarcopenia, uh, varicose bleed, ascites, and encephalopathy. These are a result of, of either poor hypertension or liver insufficiency. Um, down the road, uh, we have a paterenal syndrome uh, as a consequence of ascites and, uh, or, and or hepatic hydrothorax. Paterenal syndrome and SPP are, are late manifestations of cirrhosis. Uh, but you see here that most of these complications are a result of poor hypertension um, or liver insufficiency. <clears throat> People cirrhosis can, can do quite well for a number of years. Um, and you see from this landmark study published 15 years ago um, that people with cirrhosis after 10 years have a 75% chance of <clears throat> being alive. Uh, but when someone has a, <clears throat> a sign of decompensation, when someone once has a sign of a vergic bleeding or ascites um, or a hepatic encephalopathy, that's when their survival plummets. You see here that at one year, their survival goes down to uh, slightly higher than 60%. So, so these are the patients that we want to focus on, people who come to liver disease, people who are at risk of, of uh, increased morbidity and mortality. Um, 
This is uh, the pathophysiology uh, of the manifestations of liver disease. Basically, it all starts with cirrhosis, causing port hypertension. Once you get to port hypertension, you, you, um, you, this, this uh, leads to splenic artery vase dilation. <clears throat> and what this means is uh, the vessels are dilated in the stomach, the liver, spleen, pancreas, small intestine, and large intestine, all the abdominal gastrointestinal organs. Uh, when you get vase dilation, um, you then get decreased resistance. Uh, and as a result, there's decreased effective arterial blood flow. Um, blood flow is very important to the body, provides a nutrients and oxygen. So what the body does is compensates and uh, leads to activation of arterial beta receptors. Um, and this is, uh, leads to um, non-osmotic ADA secretion. The, the result is you get uh, water retention, you get uh, SNS stimulation, which leads to base constriction of the vessel throughout the body, and you get the RAS activation, lead to sodium retention. Uh, these all counter uh, effect, uh, decrease effective arterial blood flow. Unfortunately, these uh, consequ have major consequences, including, um, including, um, including a water retention, uh, and hyperperfusion of, of may some major organs like the kidneys. Uh, and it, uh, as you saw, the, the major predictor of survival was uh, the manifestation of hepatic decompensation. There are additional studies that show other predictors of cirrhosis. Um, it's the uh, serum cranial level. And you see from this landmark study published four years ago that the higher the cranial level, the worse survival. In this very large study that goes off for, for a couple of years, see that the uh, cranial above 1.5 is associated with survival of less than 50% at 500 days. And as you know from, from your rotations, the serum cranial is also part of a major predictor models of survival, including the uh, uh, MELD score and the MELD sodium score. Um, this contributes to uh, predicting uh, who will survive or will not survive. We have problems with serum cranial levels. Uh, one of the issues is that it may not truly reflect um, um, kidney function. Uh, due to people with cirrhosis uh, tend to have sarcopenia. Uh, people with cirrhosis go through a state of starvation and they start eating away their muscles. This becomes particularly exaggerated uh, um, when patients have uh, ascites. When you draw a fluid from someone's ascites fluid, paracentesis, um, you draw protein with it, and that eats away the muscles at a faster rate. So due to low muscle mass cirrhosis, uh, the serum cranial really doesn't um, estimate renal function that, that well. It overestimates. And unfortunately, um, there's also racial differences in measuring serum cranial. This is from a, a, a paper just published last week in the Journal of Medicine looking at, at new ways uh, to predict kidney function uh, that's independent of race. And this is using um, uh, the, the uh, system EC equations, um, highlighting that we need to do a better job um, and estimating kidney function, um, not just among cirrhotic patients, uh, but patients of color as well. So acute kidney injury is a major milestone in people with liver disease. Um, we have a number of issues I mentioned with the cranial levels, but uh, prior to deficient kidney injury, and we'll talk about what that means in a short minute, but prior to deficient kidney injuries, you know, unfortunately, identify patients late in the course. And like everything else in medicine, the sooner you're identifying um, a problem, the sooner you can intervene, the better the outcomes. And indeed, uh, uh, intervention with the kidney injury is no, um, no strength to this. Uh, with early intervention, it is sort of, uh, with uh, improved outcomes. Um, as part of the changes in our concept of acute kidney injury, is a realization that hepatitis syndrome is not just a functional disorder. Um, I know that in my training, Nick's training many years ago, uh, we thought this was a, a dynamic process that when you when someone's got hepatitis syndrome um, and you correct it, um, that this this functional change uh, improves. But we're going to see very shortly that we actually have structural problems that are persistent uh, and may cause permanent damage. Um, 
in uh, in hepatitis syndrome, we've learned it's become a part of a systemic inflammation. Um, so these new uh, new concepts of acute kidney injury allow for better prosecution. This is uh, the new definition of acute kidney injury. Although this paper was published six years ago, um, we are just just now appreciating and utilizing in our own practice. But you see here in stage one that a change in cerebrocranial of 0.3 um, defines acute kidney injury. So think about your patient with, with liver disease and have a cranny of 0.6, and now the cranny is 0.9 or 1.0. Well, you might think in your mind, well, that's not too bad. They're still within normal limits. But in reality, for that particular patient, that patient now suffers from acute kidney injury and you need to intervene. And we're going to talk about what that means in a very short while. <clears throat> but changes of 0.3 cranny uh, defines acute kidney injury and allows you to intervene at an earlier stage. Um, the other stages of acute kidney injury uh, are, are, are much more severe. You see our stage two means a two to threefold uh, uh, increase of base from baseline. So if someone had a cranny of 0.6, now it becomes 1.2, um, that's stage two. Uh, and stage three uh, is a three or fourfold increase in simcranian or the initiation of renal placement. Um, so, you know, these, these stages are not very granular. There's only three stages. Uh, for this whole spectrum of supercranial changes. But I, I do want to highlight that a change of 0.3 um, already defines acute kidney injury. So in your patient with cirrhosis, when you see these changes, you really cannot ignore because it can have strong prognostic indications. What are some causes of acute kidney injury that, uh, in people with cirrhosis? Um, these could be due to medications, uh, aminoglycosides and other antibiotics, uh, contrast used for CT scans, uh, sepsis. Um, they can be due to glomerular problems, uh, chronic hepatitis B and C. Uh, the classic one is IgA nephropathy. Um, they can also be due to antibiotics, uh, institutional nephritis, non um, uh, and protein pump inhibitors. So medications play a major role in causing acute kidney injury. We're going to hear at the, at the end of the talk some medications to avoid but I'll give you a, a, a short taste right now. There are three classes of drugs that are absolutely contraindicated with cirrhosis. Those include nosteroidals, uh, include aminoglycosides, and ACE inhibitors. Um, and, the, and the categories of AKI could also be uh, either volume responsive or non-responsive. They could be pre-renal, post-renal. And you see volume responsive, um, people with have emesis or diarrhea. Uh, and diarrhea can be, <clears throat> iatrogenic from um, lactose used for hepatic encephalopathy, or someone comes in with a varicose bleed, uh, or someone who's on, who's on flu restrictions, um, who, or has undergone a large volume paracentesis without album replacement, um, or another reason for volume responsive pre-renal category of AKI is excessive diuretic therapy. Someone's got ascites, and you try to up to the diuretics to see if you can mobilize that fluid. Um, drugs, infection, uh, and then you have volume non-responsive pattern syndrome, and we're going to talk about what that means in a, in a very uh, short minute, and also post-renal obstructive. So, um, you know, as an extension of our examination, someone who has acute kidney injury, particularly in stages two and three, we want to do an ultrasound to make sure there's no obstruction. So this is a, a landmark study by Garcia Sao, uh, published over, over a decade ago, that looks at the prevalences an etiology of acute kidney injury in patients with cirrhosis. This was focusing on patients uh, who are hospitalized. Um, and basically they looked at the visuals hospitalized, um, you know, over, over a thousand patients and found that that 1% had chronic renal failure that could be from diabetes, hypertension. Um, but 19% of people who are hospitalized with cirrhosis, 19%, one out of five individuals had acute kidney injury. And you see here in this uh, third row of blocks that the vast majority, uh, two thirds were pre-renal. Uh, this could be due to, um, you know, over diuresis, uh, water restrictions, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, a third uh, were intrarenal, ATN, rhinophritis, and less than 1%, very rarely, was a post-renal obstructive etiology. Uh, other pre-renal, 
Uh, the, again, the majority were uh, volume responsive. They're given albumin, they're given fluids, and their kidney function improved. Um, but unfortunately, uh, a big subset were non volume responsive. These individuals that went on to kidney failure. These are pattern syndromes, type 1 and type 2. And we're going to define these very shortly. So, what is a pattern renal sy syndrome type? Uh, what is a, I'm sorry, what is a pattern renal syndrome? Well, these are the, the kind of like clinical definitions. And basically, what you, what you see is um, increasing um, levels of serum creatinine uh, with decreasing urine output. Uh, and when you do a UA, uh, the urine is normal. There's not cash, there's not proteinuria, there's no blood. Um, and if you do a, a urine sodium, sodium extraction, um, it's less than 10. So the body uh, is really holding on to the sodium levels. Um, and uh, uh, urinating more fluid than salt. Imaging, um, you're going to see cirrhosis, of course, by definition, um, and uh, no signs of any obstruction. And clinically, for Petterman syndrome, people tend always to have ascites. Uh, no recent nephrotoxic drugs and, and no shock. This shock and uh, nephrot nephrotoxic drugs can also lead to uh, syndromes that can mimic hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, these are the uh, formal definitions of a pattern syndrome. You see here on the left side of the screen, the old definition that, that Nick and I grew up with, type 1, type 2. Type 2 means someone's got kind of refractory ascites and, and, and chronic elevated cranial levels. Um, and in type 1 is when you start having a rapid increase in cranial levels, um, decreasing your output, uh, and no response, no response to fluids, uh, including albumin. Um, the new definitions are, are, are a little more uh, salient. You see here for uh, the new definitions, we no longer use the terms type one and type two. Now we use um, HRS, pattern syndrome, AKI, acute kidney injury, uh, and HRS, non-AKI. Uh, you see here that again, going back, uh, they utilize uh, the, these new definitions of acute kidney injury. So a serum cranial level of more than 0.3 within 40 hours, or an increased serum cranial of, of um, greater than 1.5 from baseline, it helps you find a pattern renal syndrome. Um, you also need to do some other things like um, make sure there's no response to fluids, uh, uh, make sure someone has cirrhosis with the ascites, make sure there's no recent shock or recent use of non-steroidals or contrast, and no signs of any uh, uh, structural kidney injury. So make sure there's no proteinuria, like the pattern of syndrome, no material, and no obstruction. But you see here that, that the new name, the new definition of a pattern of syndrome utilizes uh, these new definitions of acute kidney injury. So keep in mind that changes of as little as 0.3 uh, can identify someone that's going on to progressive kidney disease. Let's go back to our definitions of uh, and the pathophysiology of pattern syndrome, this all starts with cirrhosis, and the cirrhosis leads to, um, you know, increasing intrahepatic resistance. So blood has a hard time getting through the liver, and as a result, you get um, you get splenic base dilation, and this leads to a number of cascades of events um, that uh, um, that's associated with the decreased effective blood flow, uh, peripheral dilation decreased resistance, and the activation of a number of pathways, including RAS and the sympathetic pathway. These unfortunately result in, in kind of limiting, uh, limiting blood flow through the kidneys, try to limit urine output to, to counteract, to counter effect the decreased uh, arterial blood volume. Um, these, so these mechanisms make sure we hold on to fluid and not urine it out. Unfortunately, that has a deleterious effect of causing kidney injury. This is from a, a very important study by Florence Wong, published six years ago, liver transplantation. And, and with, with Dr. Wong and her colleagues, it looked at outcomes of patients with cirrhosis and a pattern renal syndrome um, who were treated with liver transplantation. And basically, she stratified patients um, with a pattern renal syndrome uh, to those who recovered and those who did not recover. So the HRS negative uh, are patients who did not recover. Um, and HRS positive, people who recovered. 
Um, no, sorry, the other way around. HRS negative people who recovered, HRS positive people did not recover. And you see uh, on the left-hand side of the slide are the precipitants and, and infections by far are the most common precipitant of a pattern renal syndrome. And in the right-hand slide, you see here are the types of infections. Uh, and again, HRS negative are people who reverse, recovered. Uh, HRS positive are people who have persistent pattern renal syndrome. Uh, and you see here that, that the, most common, the most common etiologies were septicemia in both groups, uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, uh, and UTI. But you see here from both these uh, figures that infections- I can't do this. Infections play a major role uh, in precipitous oh, syndrome. syndrome. Um, other things like, like GI bleed, uh, excessive diuresis, large volume paracentesis, also play a role, but not as much as an infection. Um, another landmark study was this one from, from Viles and they're published in Nephr Nephrology, but basically it highlights the evolution of pattern syndrome. And, and although in the beginning stage of pattern syndrome, uh, the damage to the kidneys are pretty functional and reversible, but over time with the pattern syndrome, uh, you, you develop ischemia because of intense basal constrictions, and this leads to tubular injury. So this highlights um, the, the, the important need to identify uh, pattern syndrome early in this course so you can make changes and seek reversal damage. Um, and those early changes are manifested by uh, serum cranial change uh, of 0.3. So why do we care about, about a pattern renal syndrome? Well, th there are a number of reasons why that is. One of them is that pattern renal syndrome is associated with increased mortality. Um, it, uh, the, it's been discussed that, that once, it goes to, once someone develops pattern renal syndrome, uh, without dialysis, um, their survival at two weeks is close to 0%. So it, it's, a, it's a harbinger of very poor outcomes. It also marks a major milestone on uh, people's cirrhosis where they have to start dialysis. Um, and you know, that's an awful life as, as it is, uh, going to a machine for you know, three days a week. These people who are very, very, very ill uh, with coagulopathy, sarcopenia, you know, and it, it's, it's very difficult to someone to survive with advanced cirrhosis months uh, on dialysis. Uh, it also marks a milestone of increased health utilization. Uh, patients are, are hospitalized more frequently. They're seeing the, the clinic more often, um, and they have to start hemodialysis. Um, a better resume associated with decreased quality of life, increasing fatigue and exhaustion. Um, uh, it's also associated with the impact potentially after liver transplantation. And we're going to show some data from Florence Wong, a landmark study looking at, um, at the impact of the uh, of, um, diagnosis of pattern syndrome on post-transplant care. Uh, on the other hand, it does change liver transparatization. Uh, and, and, uh, and when we calculate people's milk scores or milk sodium scores, um, there is a box checked off whether someone's on hemodialysis for, I think, two or three days. Here's a, 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 a very important study published in the Journal of Pathology. Uh, over uh, 10 years ago now, but the message still resonates today. And that is when someone develops a pattern renal syndrome, and this study here uses the old definitions of pattern renal syndrome, uh, their survival plummets. You know, having ascites all associated with decreased survival, but nothing holds a candle to develop pattern renal syndrome, where their survival you see here at 100 days um, is, uh, is less 60% uh, for type two and for type one, at 100 days, your survival is less than 20%. So clearly, um, developed pattern renal syndrome is something we want to avoid because it's associated with, with severe outcomes, um, namely increased morbidity and mortality. Um, this is from the, from the study from Florence Wong, um, really defining the outcomes of individuals um, who underwent liver transplantation with deficient pattern renal syndrome. And basically, it highlights that those individuals whose pattern renal syndrome you identified early and reversed and re 
and they reverse with liver transplantation, their cranny is much improved. Those individuals who you transplant later, later in their, in their pattern renal syndrome course, you know, you cannot reverse a pattern renal syndrome anymore. Um, and, and unfortunately, the cranny continues to be elevated uh, post liver transplantation. So you see here on the, on the end of the slide at month 12 of individuals whose hepatic renal syndrome was not reversed, uh, their cerebral cranny remains elevated at three. Uh, and unfortunately, the individual will eventually um, require dialysis after liver transplantation or uh, a second organ transplant, that is a kidney transplantation. Um, survival also is affected. Um, and you see here in the patients who are reverse, uh, a top grid, a top line, their survival at, 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 uh, at 10 years is excellent. But those individuals whose hepatic syndrome could not be reversed with liver transplantation, um, their survival is significantly worse. Um, you see here at, at one year, uh, those patients with hepatic syndrome was not reversed uh, was at 60% versus over 95% uh, people with hepatic syndrome was reversed. So reverse hepatic syndrome is critical and associated with improved survival, associated with improved post-transplant survival, morbidity, and mortality. So given that the pathophysiology of a pattern winner syndrome allows us to kind of um, talk about tailored therapy um, to treat the pattern winner syndrome, we know that, that we have a cardiac dysfunction as a result of the number of pathways. We can talk about use of albumin, we know we have uh, arteriovase dilation, um, and we could talk about the use of midarin to, to counteract that. Uh, um, we could talk about using vasoactive drugs uh, like norepinephrine, terlipressin, and acreotide. Um, we know that, uh, that the basis for all this, the fulcrum, is uh, advanced liver disease. So we could talk about um, replacing the liver. Um, as a treatment for pattern syndrome in select patients. Um, we could talk about methods to, um, to, that lead to recovery hepatic failure. So this is particularly true in the patient with alcohol hepatitis with someone developed alcohol hepatitis, severe, uh, admitted, they're yellow, like, like, for, like a fluorescent marker. Um, and then, uh, and it, if their liver recovers, their kidney recovers as well. Um, you know, an important marker of liver function is a serum cranny, believe it or not. It's an extension of the, of the liver disease. So when the liver improves, serum cranny improves too. Uh, we see also with people with the acute hepatitis B or A, uh, when, when, they're, when they're near fulminant conditions, their kidney function deteriorates as well. And, and lastly, and, and very controversial, uh, is tips. If the, if the basis for all this is cirrhosis and port hypertension, what happens if you treat the port hypertension directly um, with this procedure? So here's the, the approach and the algorithm to the management of acute kidney injury. Again, remember that changes as little as 0.3 um, are important to identify, um, and we want to act on this. So if we see an acute uh, serum cranial is 0.3, um, and the increase is uh, less than twofold from the baseline. Um, then you stratify to either type 1A or 1B. Um, and the 1A you want to monitor, um, or you may want to do is, is cut down the diuretics. So if we start seeing a change of 0.3, we might cut the diuretics by, by half um, or altogether uh, and, and multiply it very closely. Um, in patients who, who have uh, more advanced uh, changes in cranny levels, um, we might want to resist it with fluids, particularly albumin, and look for resolution. Uh, and if, the, if their credit doesn't improve, we'll stop in diuretics, we'll give them album, albumin infusion as a challenge. Um, and then we had to go to the next step um, if the credit doesn't improve with vasoconstrictors and albumin. So, what are we looking for? We're looking for improvement in serum cranny levels. We want to see a return to a, a baseline of uh, serum cranny levels. Um, the drug that is used most commonly uh, in most of the country now is a combination of midarin and atriotine. Um, uh, but the data is not that good for, the, for this combination of drugs, although it's used 
pretty routinely our institution here at UCLA. Uh, and if you look at the, at the responses, um, they're pretty poor um, in clinical studies. Um, the response with midterm creatine complete response is seen in you know, less than 30% of patients. Um, and a partial respond, response um, um, uh, is also very similarly low. Um, we're going to compare this with other um, ther therapies for treating um, pederman syndrome. But you see the data for triatide and minerin, all those used routinely in a clinical practice, um, the hard data in the literature suggests uh, it's not that effective. TIPS, I know this, I know this is very, very controversial, but TIPS is, is a way of restoring the, the poor pressure so we back to normal again. As you know, the most common indication in the United States for TIPS is a refractory ascites or, or refractory varus bleed. This common indication for TIPS may include hepatic hydrothorax or, or scoring edema. Um, but it's, the TIPS is probably the best tool we have other than liver transplantation uh, for treating port hypertension. And basically it involves uh, connecting the hepatic vein uh, to one of the tributaries of the portal vein. And this stores the pressures and restores the numbers. Uh, and indeed, uh, studies have shown that the TIPS is associated uh, with increased urine sodium excretion. You see from the study here, these, these, uh, this meta-analysis or some review that a number of studies have highlighted that at 12 to 14 months, uh, this urine sodium excretion goes up by a thousand percent. And a number of studies also have highlighted improvement of serum cranial levels um, at four to six months, there's been a, a 50 and decrease in certain cranial level. So highlighting, highlighting reversal of a, of a, of a pattern syndrome and increasing um, urinary blood flow indirectly. If you look at, the, uh, at all these pathways that lead to intense vasoconstriction, um, hyperperfusion of the vessels of the kidneys, you see here that the plasma renal activity decreases, aldosterone uh, levels go down, and neuroadrenaline levels uh, go down as well. But the problem is, the problem is that these patients um, who have a pattern syndrome are very, very sick. Um, they invariably all have ascites, sarcopenia, uh, and many of them have um, elevated bilirubin levels. So unfortunately, this might look great in, in, in clinical studies. In real life, TIPS is rarely used. Um, I don't remember the last time I've ever used a tips of pulmonary syndrome, because the patient is just so, so sick. Um, our, 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 our center utilizes uh, a male score of 20 um, uh, as a threshold uh, for identifying patients who are no longer TIPS candidates. And unfortunately, when you get to our syndrome, the majority of people have, um, have a male scores above 20. So this is great for, for, for clinical studies. Uh, great for um, uh, proof of concept, but in reality, no one really uses the TIPS. Um, uh, a number of studies ha have, you have looked at uh, basal active substances, um, trilopressin, or neuroadrenaline, uh, and indeed, the trilopressin um, is found very, very effective. Uh, um, some studies have found it to be, uh, however, no better than neuroadrenaline, um, uh, but it is found to be much better than a, um, a triatide and midrin. Uh, the question always is, you know, the um, um, uh, will be whether uh, these transit, these changes translate uh, to improve outcomes. And that's, I think, is very controversial. Uh, although we, we can improve serum cranial levels, we can improve, improve hyperperfusion of the kidneys. Um, whether it translates to improves outcomes, I think some studies have argued you could, um, but I think it's still very, very controversial. Um, now, before I go on, I do want to highlight one question that came up uh, through the chat, and that is, will triatine emitter and help in hyponatremia associated with cirrhosis? And the answer is yes. And I don't know what Nick's experience has been at, at Rogers, but, um, but we've had patients who, who's even ascites got better with a triatine emitter. So uh, the short answer is yes, uh, they could help. So this takes us to, 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 to 2021, to today. And, and what is the state of affairs uh, with treating a pattern syndrome? 
Well, this is a manuscript published in, in Lungeal Medicine, again, by the same author as uh, uh, Florence Wong, who talked about outcomes of patients who were transferred with Hyperman syndrome. And what she and her authors did, uh, and her colleagues, was randomized patients um, who had pateroreno syndrome, and you see below the, the inclusion criteria, the inclusion criteria, to either take telepressin or placebo um, after album. And album was allowed to be used uh, loosely throughout the whole study. Um, the use of telepressin um, really met one of its endpoints, that is reversal of, of a pateroreno syndrome. Um, clinical success was 32% versus 17%. Um, uh, um, um, avoiding can you uh, avoiding dialysis uh, was seen in thirty four percent of patients versus seventeen percent. Um, so across the board, uh, these telepressin really uh, did a great job in in terms of uh, reversing hepatitis syndrome. Um, however, it did come at a price, and we're going to talk about th this price very shortly in a little more detail. But um, adverse effects events. Uh, we're seeing at, at, a, at a higher proportion of people with pateroreno syndrome versus those with placebo. And if you, if you look all the way in the bottom at the second um, red box, you see that the big thing was uh, respiratory failure, um, seen in 10% of people with telepressin uh, versus only 3% of individuals who received placebo. Uh, and these are the, uh, uh, these results are also, so we're also uh, disappointing is that the use of telepressin was not, not associated with improved overall survival or transplant fee survival. Although telepressin did a great job in terms of uh, reversing pateroreno syndrome in select individuals, um, unfortunately, it didn't translate to improved survival. Uh, and, it, and it goes back to what Nick and I have learned many years, is that people tend to die of their underlying cirrhosis. And although uh, telepressin and similar drugs may help um, deal with the manifestations of portopotentin and liver insufficiency, i.e. kidney failure, um, unless you're able to replace the liver, um, someone's survival is going to be impacted. Uh, and, and this is uh, the side effects in much more detail, particular mortality rates. A total of nine patients died in telepressin versus only one in the, in the placebo arm. Uh, and the most common cause of death of patients in the telepressin arm was respiratory failure. Um, you see here uh, the other causes, compatibility are similar, but respiratory failure really um, overshadowed um, those deaths in uh, telepressin versus placebo. So what does that leave us today? Well, you know, how, how, how is our um, algorithm for, liver, uh, for, for, for transplantations change? Well, so given the fact that, that, um, that pedigree syndrome early on may cause only functional changes, uh, but as time goes on, it causes uh, permanent non-reversible changes. Um, most centers in the United States um, uh, um, highlight that the threshold for for function versus permanent damage in six weeks. So someone who's on dialysis for less six weeks um, could go on forward with the liver transplant alone. But if someone's in dialysis for more than six weeks, um, more than a month and a half, um, we believe at that point there is structural permanent damage to the kidneys that will not improve after liver transplantation. So these individuals are then, are then identified for simultaneous liver kidney transplantation. And those individuals who undergo are less than six weeks, but, um, but still develop a kidney failure after transplantation, they are put in an expedited kidney transplant list. So they won't have to wait more than a year. So, so, the, so what perspective liver transplant have in pedigree syndrome? Um, you know, it, it, one of the issues that, that Nick and I have talked about in the past it is if you're able to improve a pedigree syndrome um, with medications like a tritiaminerin uh, or vasoactive medications like norepinephrine or, or adrenaline, what impact would they have on people on the, kidney, on the liver transplant list? Because being on dialysis does give some prioritization for liver transplantation. And if you improve kidney function, but the patient remains very, very ill, their cirrhosis has not been fixed, 
Um, are you actually causing harm? Are you delaying a transplantation? Are you putting someone in a medical limbo? So that's something that's been discussed at, at, in many meetings that, that Nick and I have attended. So the, the, best, the best thing is, is prevention, right? Um, you you want to prevent from getting to acute kidney injury. You want to prevent from seeing change to 0.3. And, and, and so there are some, some important rules, and that is avoiding certain classes of drugs, aminoglycosides, non steroidals, ACE inhibitors. Um, you know, when someone is decompensated and they have market ascites, you know, at, at some point, directs um, aren't working. Um, and, and and so you you know you're you're trying to trying to have someone uh, mobilize fluid with diuretics, <clears throat> um, but if someone's got a fracture site, it ain't gonna work. And all you're gonna do is cause kidney failure. So you know, so um, so be careful about about over diuresis in someone who's got uh, very advanced ascites. At some point, they stop working. Um, you know, be careful about over over the, using lactose too much and causing diarrhea. Uh, we had a patient come into the hospital with hypernatremia. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, in kidney injury from overuse of lactose, lady have very brittle uh, encephalopathy and she's having eight ten bowels per day. Uh, controversial area, which I have not talked on, not not touched upon today, was the role of beta blockers uh, and the need to maintain miniature pressures. Um, there, are, uh, the other thing is, I'm sure you know already, when you know peritonitis uh, and infection was a is a known common precipitant of Penrose syndrome. So to counteract that, um, albumin uh, is infused, uh, and we know that that is improved, is associated with uh, with uh, maintaining kidney function and preventing these cascade of events of kidney failure, and also believe it or not, it's associated with improved mortality. Uh, what we do not, unfortunately, what we were missing in hepatology is an accurate way to assess volume status. So we have a hard time assessing how much album to use. And one of the theories why toilet pressure was not found to be um, effective in improving survival and, a, and was associated with increased morbidity was um, perhaps indiscriminate use of album um, in the toilet pressure group. Uh, I know uh, Nick is cringing in his seat right now, but uh, Rifaximin is, you know, uh, is a major player in the treatment of hepatic encephalopathy. I came across this study here that uh, that shows rifaximin may be helpful in other situations, and that is patients who were to prescribe rifaximin for hepatic encephalopathy um, appeared to have uh, less chances of develop hepatorenal syndrome. Um, it kind of it kind of makes sense, right? Says so inflammation infections are at the heart of hepatorenal syndrome, um, and this a lot of it can be due to translocation. Uh, from uh, bacterial intestines. Well, if, 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 you, if you maintain the proper menu, if you prevent dysbiosis, um, perhaps you can reduce inflammation infection that translocates um, and it spares someone uh, acute kidney injury or panorenal syndrome. So there, I think there is a biology basis for this, um, but, but, whether, but, I, but, um, but we need more data, we need more data. So in conclusion, Hepatorenal syndrome is a late manifestation of cirrhosis and associated morbidity and mortality. Hepatorenal syndrome without dialysis has a mortality rate of 100% at, at two weeks. Uh, the updated definition of acute kidney injury allow for early diagnosis and intervention. And you see here the changes as little as 0 0.3, 0 0.3 um, can identify as someone who's maybe going on the spectrum, on this pathway of Paterina syndrome. And current treatment of Paterina syndrome, um, unfortunately, are limited by low efficacy rates. You saw data by using a tritide emitter. Um, but this represents a, a major unmet need and opportunity for growth in hepatology. So at this point, I'm, I wanna thank everybody for, for dialing in today, uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, on a pattern of syndrome. And I think we have a, a minute for any questions or comments uh, in the chat or, or uh, uh, Dr. Saab, I'm uh, Lisa Deaver, the vice chair. I think we had communicated by email and our profuse apologies for our, oh, we've been, we've been no doing problem. this for 
you know, how long, over a year and a half, and there, all of the computers in the chair's office were echoing. So uh, Dr. Klappholz, our chair sends his apologies. And no and, problem. And I have to say, you must be a very good friend of Nick be, to get <laughs> up and do a ground rounds at 5 a.m. For those of you who are paying attention, he's on the, he's in LA. And so he's uh, got uh -huh. up in the wee hour of the morning to do our grand rounds. So, you know, since we started late, I'd like to, you know, we can extend our time because I have a lot of questions lined up in the, oh, sure. in the chat box to, um, to you and we'd like to get to some of them. So sure. from Dr. Tefesh, one of our uh, new hepatologists uh, who's joined us, um, his comment is, is, is we see more patients with NASH, cirrhosis and hypertension. Do you think that HRS can be diagnosed in a patient who's normotensive or relatively hypertensive? Um, given the physiology and a reduced effective arterial pressure of the kidneys? And then if so, what uh, blood pressure would you target when treating with vasopressors, um, midodrine or albumin to improve renal function? So, so that, that is a very high level and, and, and a very good question. So, so, you know, we're all struggling to see um, what impact um, people with fatty liver have on our medical care. You know, there are, there are ample examples of people even screening for liver cancer with fetal fatty liver and difficulty identifying small tumors. And, and I think much work needs to be done still on NASH. And, and he's, and the doctor's right, you know, NASH right now has become the second most common reason for liver transplantation. But, but how, that translates to, how that translates to change in our treatment paradigm is still unclear. And, and I, I would agree that, that our thresholds probably need to better look at in terms of a goal maps uh, and a goal blood pressures uh, for treating with uh, with vasoactive substance, but it's still unclear. It's still unclear how the serum craning level um, will be affected by by, by NASH um, and how accurate they will be for identifying people with acute kidney injury. But uh, unfortunately, we just need we just need more and more data. Um, and from Dr. Niazza, another one of our hepatologists, and you may have partially covered this, uh, the survival data specifically on HRS type one with TIPS. Oh, so so uh, so so uh, so I'm glad you brought that. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I I do not do not recommend TIPS in these individuals. Um, uh, for for type for for the classic type one. For type two, so they bring up a good point. So. In type two, the data has been pretty controversial because what happens is with type two, um, you know, they have refractory ascites and indeed their pore pressures do get better. But you have to be careful though, um, because in the tips, you do use contrast. And, and as you know, contrast, uh, you know, could play a heavy toll on the kidneys. So if you do do, if you do, do tips in someone's got a panorous type, type two refractory ascites with elevated cranial levels, you have to be careful about using contrast. The survival data looks very, very good for type two. Um, you know, uh, you know, tips used to be seen as a, only as a bridge for liver transplantation. And for many of these individuals <clears throat> who have early type two pattern syndrome, refractory ascites, um, their survival is improved. There have been a number of studies in, in hepatology demonstrating that. Great question, by the way. <laughs> We have great hepatologists here. So they sure do. <laughs> uh, and here's another question. The role of uh, continuous renal replacement therapy or hemodialysis on the survival of patients with HRS. Wow. So that's a really good question. So uh, it, it, the role of dialysis, it, um, so dialysis in these individuals should really be seen only, only as a bridge for transplantation to get someone to, to transplant. Because when you get to pattern syndrome, um, people are generally pretty sick with sarcopenia or factory ascites. And, and just, the idea, just the concept of doing that hemodialysis of someone that's sick for extended period of times, uh, it's difficult. The survival is, is not that high. You know, classically, um, classic, the only time we thought about extending, extended dialysis with pedal syndrome is someone who came with alcohol hepatitis. Uh, and those individuals, we, we would have to wait six months for a little transplantation. Uh, most centers today no longer have a time criteria. Um, so fortunately, uh, you know, we don't see as many patients um, who have an extended use of dialysis with pedagogical syndrome. Uh, they usually get transplanted uh, or, or have other outcomes. Um, but, the, the, but the survival data is very, very poor for long-term use. It is still doing well for a number of reasons, particularly infections. They tend to die of infections. <clears throat> 
And from one of our infectious disease uh, colleagues, Dr. Varghese, who is the director of our, uh, our transplant infectious diseases, she was saying that the looking at your um, one of your uh, slides, the use of terlipressin mm. seemed to have more patients have sepsis than the placebo group. And any thoughts of what the mechanism of that may be? Oh, wow! Very, very astute, very, very, uh, very astute observation. It's probably from 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 lines. Uh, from lines, um, it, it may be something as simple as that, and, and uh, so I don't think there's any magical. But but the, I, I think that data um, it needs a lot of review still. I mean, you know, it was very disappointing that the survival wasn't any different. But but the the, the ID special is correct that the infections were higher, respiratory failures were higher as well. And from Dr. Guevara, uh, one of our intensivists. Um, Thanking you for a great talk, which it was. Thank you so much. And any input on volume assessment of these? Oh, things? so thank you, thank you, Dr. Guevara. That, that's one of the things I pointed out, and and thank you for pointing that out again. It, it, is that you know we don't have a good way to assess a good non-invasive way to assess volume in these individuals. And so one of the things that we're struggling with, with right now is when you fluoresce so fluoresce someone, you know, when what's your threshold for stopping or cutting down? And one of, the, one of the arguments why the telepressor group did worse in the New England Medicine article is that it's got too much album, too much fluid, and they got fluid overload and went to respiratory failure. So we do not have a good non-invasive, and, and that to be a, a great project for, for a hepatologist, intensivist, or, or critical care person. And, and, and direct, you know, and, but invasive, we, we can measure MAPS, um, but we do not have a great non-invasive volume assessment of these patients. Great comment, thank you. And one last question from Dr. Oliva, one of our um, hepatologists also, and I think a lot of us have this question, any role of routine albumin infusion in to prevent HRS? Uh, great question. So, so I, I think that, that, that I think Nick's involvement in the study looking at this, um, from my understanding is that there was a trial published in Europe, but it, 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 was, it did not show any much difference at all. So right now we, we limit albumin to um, to you know to patient undergo a large volume of prostheses over five liters to prevent these fluid shifts. Um, but uh, as routine basis, I don't I don't think there's any data for that. But great question. Well, thank you so much. We have actually multiple more questions, but we uh, you know in the interest of time. And again, thank you so much. And again, our deepest apologies oh. for our technical glitches, mm -hmm. but this is really an important topic for us uh, with our, you know, uh, hepatology patients. And again, now you have, can start your day at six o'clock <laughs> uh, there. So that's awesome. Um, but thank, but thank you for inviting me. And, and I, I'm, I'm just happy you didn't cancel your schedule. <laughs> so I'm happy you kept it. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you everybody for joining us. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Saab. Take bye care. Bye, have a good too. day. Bye and bye. Good day to everybody.